All right, good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Kuhar. I'm uh, primarily a vegetable entomologist, so I work on, on vegetable pest management, but there's a lot of pests that are also in soybeans. And uh, through the years, I've collaborated with, with first Ames Herbert and then now Sally Taylor at the Tidewater AREC. And we've, we've really, any of the students that have come through there and done soybean pest management programs, I've probably also been on their committees and, and uh, well aware of their projects. So um, one of the pests that is in soybeans and also vegetable crops is corn earworm. Um, pests that, raise your hand if you know what corn earworm is and have seen it damage soybeans. I would hope if you grow that crop, you've probably seen it here in Virginia. Um, but what we've got with this handout is some of the collaborative work that we've done. We have a graduate student, Kemper Sutton, who's working on edamame, which we'll hear about a uh, little bit later. but. Um, is, is also working on corn airworm in particular. And, and uh, so if you look at this sheet, um, what I've listed at the top in a, in a table is the current insecticides. If you're a soybean grower, there's probably one of these on here that you've used before, I would, I would guess, because these are the labeled products. To the left, you see a lot of pyrethroids, and that's where I want to start. Um, pyrethroids have pretty much been a staple in soybean production. Um, there's good reasons for that. It's a it's a cheap insecticide, it's broad spectrum. Uh, for the longest part, it would pretty much kill anything that you needed to kill in soybeans. It gets your stink bugs, get your, get your caterpillars, things like corn earworms. So that was an easy answer to insect pest management in soybeans. I mean, you had a cheap, effective product and you got the job done with that. Um, that went on for a long time until, and I wanna draw your attention now to couple of the charts. I'm going to keep this quick. We're talking about one insect and one problem that we got going on. But that bottom left chart that you see right there, notice in 2008, all of a sudden you saw a change in that graph. Um, what that is, is, is uh, we were, I say we because we were doing it in multiple sites in Virginia um, for years and all over the south. Um, we're basically monitoring whether you would collect the moths at black light traps, pheromone traps, and basically put that moth in these cypermethrin as a type of pyrethroid, put them in these vials and 24 hours later, they should all be dead. So when we all started, we killed all the moths. That's a really high dose for that moth to pick up. And um, we started, it started in the deep south where you're not killing them all. There were some that made it through, but 2008, you saw a big change. We all of a sudden got a lot of resistance genes in our populations and um, that hasn't changed since 2008. We basically have the potential for pyrethroid resistance in our corn airworms that we get every year. And um, that's what we learned. We expected that to go up and up and up until pyrethroids didn't work anymore. That's what everyone predicted. Um, but the one thing you're probably not hearing a lot of is that here we are now, what, 2021? That has not kept going up and up and up. Um, it's stabilized and possibly even gone down. Anyone might want to suggest why that went down? Why would something like that go down resistance? It always goes up, right? Why do you think it might have settled and if, if not even possibly dropped a little bit to where pyrethroids are actually working pretty well? We've been using more non products. There you go. A little bit about, well, yeah, that's kind of the same thing, a refuge in a sense that that's exactly what's happened. I've got some colleagues in the Deep South and, and uh, Mississippi and things like that. They're like, yeah, we don't spray pyrethroids anymore. So there was a scare, there was a problem, and there was a change in, in what they're using. Well, what's happened is we get those moths <laughs> that aren't being sprayed with pyrethroids anymore. So their population, their genetics has been so that what we get in Virginia is probably um, some corn airworms now that might have it in their population, but pyrethroids are actually, for the most part, still working. Um, is, is that true? Well, we're doing things like, look at the other chart to the right. So um, what that is, is, is Kemper, this graduate student, I'm just showing you the Lambda Cyhalothrin data. This is one of the most popular pyrethroids, the one in Warrior and Karate. Um, we have data on other ones, but this is the two years, 2020, 2021, in multiple locations around Virginia. Um, to the right is the susceptible colony. So we're taking an edamame seed um, or, or, or pod, dipping it in lambda cyhalothrin and then putting a corn airworm that we collect from the field. Um, 
is basically the bioassay. And the susceptible colony, we're killing them all. Get that from North Carolina. But then this is what's happening around Virginia. And what you've seen is actually from 2020 to 2021, we're actually killing more this year than we were last year. So we were at a scare. We were almost ready to tell growers to stop using pyrethroids. Um, that was where we were at. We were ready. Some, some were even suggesting that. But I think where we're at now is that it may not be as bad as we thought. And you just need to be careful. You need to know that it's possible. There's resistance genes out there. Um, but if you rotate, that's one of the lessons, right? You rotate your chemistries. Maybe not always just keep hitting them with that pyrethroid. Um, if you keep that lesson up, I think we're in pretty good shape that that pyrethroid is there and it's, it's going to give you something. And if it, it might give you excellent control based on, I do sweet corn work every year too. And that's really hard to control corn airworm and sweet corn. Out at Kentland Farm, we get 100% control with pyrethroids. Um, down in Abingdon, 100% control with pyrethroids. Eastern Shore, well, maybe not, but uh, we're still getting 60% control. So there's, there's just this lot of fluctuation in the population. And um, so that's a message that, that uh, one of the things we wanted to send. And Sally Taylor as well, um, we've been texting about this and emailing. But the other thing I want you to say, okay, so if you do rotate, that's a good thing to do. Rotate your chemistries away from pyrethroids. You got these, these middle products, which are non-pyrethroid options, things that you can get away from those. Um, Probably not heard of Vanticore or Elevest. Any soybean growers heard of those chemicals? Probably not. I'm not seeing any head shake because these are new ones, brand new ones, um, but they may not be too... Uh, you've probably heard of Prevathon, right? Prevathon's a diamide. Well, that Vanticore is the same thing. What it is is a little more concentrated so that it's a little cheaper when you spray per acre um, it going out. So. Um, that's that one. Uh, and then Elevest is one you've probably sprayed Besiege, right? It's got a pyrethroid with a, with a diamide, very, very popular compound. We have another diamide with a pyrethroid compound that's out there, and that's Elevest. So that's good for the growers because you've got competition, you've got, you've got options and things like that. So two new compounds, all these work very well. They're listed there. And the other thing I'm going to end with is that last column. These are things that are currently in the 2021 pest management guide that probably need to be taken out. I've talked to Sally Taylor, she agrees. Uh, and the first one is anything that's got chlorpyrifos in it. Um, some of you are probably aware of the, uh, that's a battle that's going on for, it's been going on for about five years. EPA, are they gonna take it out or are they not? Um, the company stopped producing Lorsban, Corteva. Um, so the company pulled out before there was ever legislation saying we're going to ban it because they, they knew what was coming. Um, and it's come. The EPA finally ruled on it in August um, that agricultural uses of chlorpyrifos are going to end. So that, that chemical's got to go um, from the books. And the other one is BT. I noticed that that was in the soybean guide. It, and from all my vegetable work, that does not work against corn airworm. Uh, because of BT uh, transgenic crops like corn and cotton, um, which the original gene, the, the, the cry protein, does not kill corn airworm. That's the one that's in the spray, like Dipel. It does not work. Promise you. I run those trials. So that's it. Any other, any other questions on corn airworm? I do a lot of stink bug work as well. So, but. yes, sir. Excellent, excellent question. And they've, they've been asking that. E EPA has been wanting to know, you know, if we take this away, what are going to be the effects? That's obviously something. And um, what we pulled up with, there's some tree fruit stuff that uh, the ones for me as a vegetable entomologist, things like cabbage, cabbage maggot, um, you couldn't beat chlorpyrifos. It was a great soil insecticide. Um, so there's things like sweet potatoes where where that was an excellent soil insecticide. It got all those things that would feed on the roots. Um, but you know, we, as entomologists, there are alternatives out there. Um, growers may not want to like it. They're clutching onto this, but it's just like, sometimes you got to let it go. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's not the worst 
chemical that we have been exposed to, but when there's enough doubt that there could be human risk, I mean, I think it's, it's time to let some of these things go that are, that are toxic. And the thing that I like to talk about, like I, I realize that we got to keep chemistries um, to have these tools when we really need them, and why can't we just hold them on to those things? But it's like, it's more than just the spraying and the residue. There's that mixing. I mean, I, I know a story of, of growers that, that mixed and some ended up in a puddle, you know, really close to where they were mixing. And then, you know, you had a dog come in there and, and it's just like, do we need to be messing with something that's that toxic when we got something that's not that toxic? It's, it's just currently costs a little bit more, but that, that goes when things go generic and it's around for a while. So e excellent question. The truth is, I think chlorpyrifos probably reached its, we don't have great reason to be hanging on to that anymore. So very good, very good question. David? Tom, what's the latest on Protons and Stuart and other products, especially looking to our south? Are we losing any of that control? And corn ear worm or other worm? <clears throat> yeah, there has been some, uh, so the, the diamide chemistries are probably one that you're talking about. There are some insects that have shown some, uh, some resistance development, like diamondback moth, which is a cabbage broccoli pest. Um, they've seen it with that. We've actually seen that in Virginia. And there have been some armyworm uh, concerns in the deep south uh, with, with some of those and Colorado potato beetle. But corn earworm, not that I know of. Um, it would not surprise me. Diamide stick around a long time in the plant, and there's a lot of exposure. and. Uh, it's only a matter of time, and, and I may be talking right now when there's someone in Mississippi, it's like, well, heck, we, we're already seeing it. It wouldn't surprise me one bit, but I've not seen, corn airworm feeds on so many things, and that works in your favor for resistance development because you're not hitting it on that crop with the same thing. You're, it's, it's everywhere. It's feeding on all these things, so that helps. Are they general, gentler on the beneficial insects than, say, the pyrethroid? Absolutely. 100 percent they're uh very uh there was work done right at your station right right there um that showed uh rebecca and she she did some great work the natural enemy populations will will, will be there working hand in hand with your diamides and and um yeah that's one but you know the, the the drawback it's softer on things it doesn't kill everything well it doesn't kill everything then stink bugs come in and they the diamides don't kill them so it's it what's Because they're sprayed with things like. Unless you spray the pyrethroid, then it's dead quiet. Yep. Plus all the spiders are going on and everything. So yeah, that's something we don't look at well enough. I agree. I agree. I do. I do that in vegetables, and I say the same thing. Um, I was walking. I, again, these Q and A sessions are making us run a little longer, but I think they're. I enjoy them. So, I will go on a little anecdote with this one. I was walking some cabbage fields just last week. Um, we were trying to collect diamondback moths and, and um, there were sections where they had harvested the cabbage and there was regrowth. And that was where we had to collect some of the things. And in that short bit of time, there were no natural enemies in where they had sprayed. And I went where the regrowth was and we were getting 60% parasitism of the diamondback moth in just that little bit of time. You gave it just a little bit of breath and the natural enemies came in and, and uh, it's a, every time that happens, it makes me shake, shake my head that we're not, we're not using that component in our programs. You know, we're just, um, there's more education that needs to go on with integrated pest management and things like diamides. It's like, yeah, we're forced to use them now. Well, that's good because they're also very IPM friendly and, and uh, things like that. So very good question. Probably should move on to the next, the next speaker, but thank you.